Hello everyone, it's Plastic EP here from Melbourne and it gives me the greatest pleasure to be with Julia Bard, John Lennon's sister and she's there near Chester. How are you today, Julia? I'm fine, I'm fine, thank you. And before we start, can I say happy, happy birthday, Mr. EP Plastic from Chester in the UK. Thank you, that's so kind of you, Julia, to do that. Now, you've got two fantastic books. I think it's a book and a CD, is it? What is it yeah, that yes, you've it got at yeah. the moment? Let's yes. talk about that. Right. Well, if I just show it to you, there. And it's called Imagine This, Growing Up With My Brother, John Lennon. So it's self-explanatory, the title. So many things have been written that are so wrong about my own family. And we've been talking about families before. And can you imagine if the horrors of what we've already been through are distorted again and again and again until they sort of almost become true? And in the end, I thought, well, I've got to do something about this. So I've written a story of our childhood explaining where John is from and how John came to be the John Lennon that we all know and love. But for me, he was two people. He was John, my brother, and he's also John, the world icon. And you have to separate them out for survival. Um, and for the background to the book, I actually spoke to Paul, Paul McCartney. And I've made a CD of our conversation there. Just called it Paul Talks. And um, it is, I've woven it through the book <coughs> because I wanted the book to be as right as possible. Of course, nobody's ever 100% correct, and no matter how much you try. But I've got Paul just chatting, chatting, chatting about the Beatles, about the start of the Beatles, about their early days. Paul talks about his own mother, about my mother, and no one can dispute that. Well, that's Paul talking. So um, I've tried to make it as correct as I can. And when I finished with this, I said that Paul said, we should do something with that. So I have. Um, I actually made it uh, years ago with Paul in his office in London on a cassette, two cassettes, and I walked out without it. And I went to meet my cousin in a pub in London and he said what have you been up to and I said you'll never guess what I've just done I've just interviewed Paul McCartney and he said my god you haven't I said I have look no tapes no tapes we ran back to the office to the MPL office which is where Paul has his office everybody had gone home it was all locked up I was back there at really early in the morning waiting for them to come and when the secretary arrived she said well I know what you've come for you left them here <laughs> so I very nearly lost it I would not have dared to ask him to do it all again because we spent the afternoon chatting so that's laced through the book as well so the book is really the, the, an old story to set the record straight as straight as I can I can appreciate that because there's a lot of folklore and one story goes from one person. By the time it goes to 10 million, yeah, it's yeah. a totally different story. It's, it's so it's really Chinese good. Whispers. Uh, it's really like, good that yeah. you spoke to Paul. And you know, you've well, got to know something, Julia. The world loves you. And here in Australia, everyone loves you. I mean, as you said, John Lennon is the legend. John Lennon is the idol. And Johnny, you don't know how many people I actually interview and they just, they love John. And John yeah. is the royal. And that is just, that is just, it, it is. He's there in pop culture, in music legend forever. Generations to yeah. come. You and I won't be here, but he's going to be immortalised forever because that's what he um, is. And that was another reason for writing the book. When I, we're all gone, people will still be, if you can see the books here, uh, hopefully books will still be around. Um, you know, people will go along. I want to know about, John Lennon and hopefully they'll look along a row of books and think oh that's his sister I think I'll read that one because so many of the experts are friends of friends of friends who have a dog and never met John and they've written the intimate details of John's life 
if it was correct, it would be one thing. But so much of it is just wacky. It's the nicest way of putting it. And I can so appreciate that. Exactly that. Like John will be. He's written into history now, isn't he? He's written into legend. Yeah. Forever. Forever and but, forever. Yeah. And, that's so. and even talking to you now, I can tell you, this is a historical interview. Because in 10 or 20 years' time, you look back at this interview with Plastic EP and you'll say, I did this interview to talk to the world and tell them what I need to tell them. And I ask you, is there any message that you'd like to give the world? Oh, my goodness. I'm not qualified to do any of that. Uh, it's um, a troubled place we're in, isn't it? Just, it's, it's the old brotherhood of man, isn't it? We need to be together. You've got the words of Imagine that says it all. We've got so much that we need to learn. And we have done from the beginning. And I think we'll still be learning whenever an end might come of the entire place. We don't seem to learn anything, do we? We seem to just go on making the same old mistakes. It's all about brotherhood, surely, of man. And you know when I say man, I mean people, mankind. About brotherhood and acceptance. And if we could do that, we wouldn't have all these wars and yeah. uh, culture wars. We've got so much to learn from each other. If only we would just... Take a step back. And now, don't the words, all you need is love, so important today in 2020. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And, and that's how I sum true. it up. All you need is love. Give peace a chance. Yeah. These are iconic statements that are going to be with mankind for the rest of our lives. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. now, Julia, I want to ask you about Strawberry Fields. Right. Strawberry Fields. I've been honoured to be asked to be an honorary president. I stress honorary, but I'm very proud of that. And I've been, Strawberry Field, right, is, uh, fans will know, it was, apart from a song, the song came out of an experience that Don had in his childhood. Strawberry Field was a Salvation Army children's home. We used to call it an orphanage, but in actual fact, Many of the children had a living parent, but Liverpool was um, a poverty stricken place at that time and um, a city where there were huge families, as in all over the place. And, you know, the um, contraception wasn't, wasn't a byword at that time, and there might have been six, seven, nine, ten children, and often the parents just couldn't look after them. So it wasn't particularly an orphanage, but it was a children's home. And it was round the corner from uh, where Mimi lived, so two minutes up the road. And Don found a sort of sanctuary there. One, because it was a girl's children's home, so he could, uh, there were all girls there, and then they put boys in later. He used to sit in a tree and watch them playing. Not just John, other people from other lads from the village. I've been born, I've born Nigel Wally, Pete Shotton, who were Don's friends, their circle of friends. Um, it closed down in 2005 as a children's home because the government policy, both in the UK and the US at the same time, government policy said that um, they were closing all these residential places down and that they were placing children in the community, a total disaster. It was a money-saving exercise, a total disaster. In the community often meant they were in care homes for uh, until they were old enough to be put into a flat. It was a disastrous move. So they did it. And it was closed and empty, still owned by the Salvation Army. And about, I don't know when they started to talk about it, before I knew about it, they started to talk about reopening it uh, obviously not as a residential home because that had gone. It is now reopened as a fabulous state-of-the-art building. Only 18 months ago, um, that takes in young people of mild to moderate learning disabilities on daytime courses. So you may have Down syndrome, Asperger's, 
um, cerebral palsy. But these youngsters have been dragged or suffered the school system in many cases because it was never meant for them. Uh, even if they've been in special schools, they've maybe left at the end of their tenure, which is the age of 16, with not much in front of them, and mainly living at home still, with very loving parents who really, there was no way forward for them. And Salvation Army have instituted Steps to Work, SPW program, Steps to Work, absolutely wonderful. And it takes in between eight and 10 students at a time, they're already up to nearly 50 before lockdown, and trains these youngsters. That sounds awful, but it is remolding them. But the first thing that they do is give them a sense of self-worth, that they are in society, that they have a place in society, and that society is actually waiting for them to join in. They just need joining up. They just need introductions to each other. And Salvation Army is doing this really, really successfully. And if you can just bear with me for one second. Of course. Uh, I have some pictures here. Um, there's a little one of the Steps to Work training program. Yep, we can see that very clear. Yeah. And they're in the most beautiful, beautiful building um, that's, that the Salvation Army has done, along with some really, really good people, the Karshis, who donated. They've donated a heck of a lot of money because they believed in the program, which is what we're looking for. They're Americans. Yep. Yeah. That? Yeah. Yeah. It's great. Right. So there's lots of... Um, it's like a school for older people where they're getting what they missed at school. But to me, the main thing is they're being reassured that they are worthy and that they have a place in society and they have opportunities to go out and work experience. If it doesn't suit them, they can go on another one. No one's asking them to work full time uh, five days a week. That's if anyone's got a job soon <laughs> after this pandemic. Uh, no one's asking them to work full time. No one's asking them to get a mortgage, have a family and 2.4 children. They're just saying, mm. welcome into the world. One day, two days, half a week. One of our youngsters now wanted to be a chef. And believe it or not, from nothing, He's now cooking for the Liverpool football team. Fantastic. Because, because we've been networking all over. The, there's constant networking. There's a team of people out there in Liverpool. Now, this place is only in Liverpool at the moment. I have visions of it being uh, launched into other cities as well and into America and into Australia, wherever the Salvation Army has been. I'm not a Salvationist. I'm really not. But the work that they are doing here is phenomenal. And uh, to be praised and lauded and take part in. And they rely on an army of volunteers. So if you're around, and, you know, if you've got Salvation Army near you, go and say, when are you going to start one of these Steps to Work programs? Because it, you know, it's in Liverpool at the moment. It needs to be everywhere. Now, in Liverpool, because it is Liverpool, it's got the state-of-the-art, iconic, 28th century building. It's like Battlestar, Battlestar Galactica. And I did actually ask um, one of our, the, the, the girl in charge of media, she's been brilliant at sending me stuff. I said, can you send me something of the building? And I don't know if that's come. I don't think it has. The building itself, go online, look at www.strawberryfield.com or one word strawberryfield.com will get you and you'll see all the pictures and you'll see what's going on there it's got a cafe of course but with really good cooking the kitchen has two levels so that people who are in a wheelchair can also be part of the cooking which is fantastic um, the cafe itself is is brilliant and people are going for roast dinners, even if they've been to the gallery many times, they're going back 
of the cafe a shop of course uh, a brilliant shop have a look at the shop online t-shirts exactly what you'd expect and a few unusual things um, but the gallery the exhibition is the story of strawberry field and it's got a mellotron that you can actually play yourself put the headphones on it's the only one interactive that you can play yourself so please have a look at the gallery go around the exhibition and then outside the stunning gardens with strawberry beds but because of lockdown have you you've had lockdown in australia haven't you yes we have so you know you know what i'm just thinking do you know what i'm talking about um, rabbits have eaten the strawberries in strawberry field, which they wouldn't have done, but because there's been nobody there, rabbits have like gnawed away at the, at the strawberries, the strawberry beds. Right outside the classrooms, the beautiful classrooms of floor to ceiling windows that the youngsters have. And in that garden, it's a little space that's all covered that you can shelter from in australia you'd say the sun in england you'd say the rain it's the umbrella from the rain here um, the original strawberry field iron gates the original original gates they've been protected they were on display in beetle story museum for years and earlier last year late last year they were brought with great ceremony through the streets of liverpool everyone was waving and um, back into strawberry field uh, the there uh, is also another set of gates that look like the original gates but they're, they're not and they won't be as solid iron they'll be an amalgam uh, where the gates were but fans were coming up and scratching bits of paint off and what you'd expect and tying things on them tying things is no problem but when people were scratching off the paint that's when they went to the museum, really to be preserved as well as for people to see them. Well, they're back now in the garden. So there's actually two sets of gates now, one on the road where the original ones were and the one in the gates. And that's a fabulous place to have your photo taken. Uh, lots of the original stone from the original building are scattered through the gardens with little sayings on the, from John's songs, which is lovely, really nice. Go on www.strawberryfield.com and you will see it. Now on my own website, where you will get the book and the CD, that is Julia Baird, one word, B-A-I-R-D, juliabaird.eu. It's European, juliabaird.eu. And I have written a blog about Strawberry Field. There's only one blog on it, and it's Strawberry Field. And if you read that, You'll get photos, little videos, and the whole history right from, I think it's 1835, when a very rich shipping magnet had this house built, the original house, Victorian Gothic mansion built uh, for himself. Next door, they built these mansions all along there. It was on the outskirts of Liverpool. It's now in Liverpool because it's grown, but it was never in Liverpool originally. It was a suburb. Um, William Gladstone, our first Liberal Dem Democrat Prime Minister, he was born in the house next door. Now the house next door became a remand home, or the Naughty Boys home, and Strawberry Field became originally a girl's children's home, and then a mixed children's home. So these huge houses were put to a different use once people had stopped living like uh, kings and queens, if you like, but the shipping was very important in Liverpool. And when they made their money, they built their houses like everywhere. That's fascinating about strawberry fields. Now, I'd like to ask you, Julia, could you please tell me your mm -hmm. favourite John song and why it's your favourite? Well, do you know what? These things change. Um, I like... I like John's song, I like Watching the Wheels. Um, I think of John as a poet in the line of Bob Dylan and Leonard Cohen. I would put the three of them like a, a nice triumvirate of uh, poets that set their songs to music. Now you can hear it plainly with Leonard Cohen because he's almost a drone, isn't he? The music, a bit of guitars going on, but he's actually actually talking poetry, isn't he? 
uh, John, of course, with Paul, uh, the, I call them the dream team, they get together and Paul's the main music man and John is the main lyric man. Not always, of course, but that's, that was their coming together. As, as I said, I call them the dream team. And uh, of course, Bob Dylan famously decries that, oh, I never said anything. I was never meant to be a leader. I never said anything to, you know, for the marches, fibber. And he got the Nobel Prize, which we were all just thrilled to bits about. He's an awkward cast, but he certainly deserved that. So I see them as poets, John included, watching the wheels. Um, he's in Dakota. Uh, Sean is five. He's beginning to think about doing things. He's actually in a hit factory um, recording what turned out to be double fantasy with you. And he's saying, <coughs> the, the, before that, the record companies have been on to him. I'm reading this just like you are. I, I didn't know it personally, but I, I read it. Uh, they, John, everyone's going to forget about you. Come out, do a song. People are going to forget your existence. Of course, they're worried about money, aren't they? Filthy Luca. They're saying, mm, we've lost this golden goose here. And John's saying, chill out you lot chill out i'm watching the wheels i'm just watching the time go around he's drumming his guitar watching telly being with sean he was taking that much needed time out it might have been five years but he needed that break he was at burnout and all the beatles needed a break and they all found their own way of reassessing and realigning and you know getting their heads back from being just a beetle. And um, Don was on his way back, but he wrote Watching the Wheels, and I think the words are fantastic. Hey, you guys, just leave me alone. Yeah. I, I need this time, I need this break. Get off my back, just leave me, I, I'm still here. And then the next one, the next um, song was starting over. Well, here I am, you've got your wish, I'm out here, but because I'm ready to be out here, starting over. Yeah. Fantastic. Now, what's your favourite Paul song? I've got to be fair to um, Paul. Uh, favourite Paul song? I love Band on the Run. Yeah. We used to call it um, Hand on the Bun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my kids, my children loved it. They were young when that came out. So I love anything that's on Band on the Run. That was his, his um, after when they all broke up and John went off to be an actor, didn't he, in Almeria and wrote the basis of what was to become the song, Strawberry Field, uh, Paul immediately did what he's still doing. Uh, formed Wings with Denny Lane, got a van, brought Linda into the band and went touring. I mean, that's what he wanted to do and he's still doing it. I mean, he's, he is the pop rock, pop icon on the planet now isn't he and he hasn't changed he loves the audience he absolutely loves having that audience so anything from um i nearly said hand on the bum it's so endemic now uh, anything from band on the run um oh i liked michelle mabel and of older songs yeah i like red rose speedway I love that album. Big Red yeah. Bar. I just love yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Um, when he does his rock songs. When exactly. have you been to a have you been to a Paul been to a Paul concert? Not as yet. He came, I think, in Melbourne in nineteen seventy six. You've got to understand. I've got a birthday, as I said, next week. I don't want to tell you my age, but sort of like I've seen all Paul's videos, all Beatle videos. I mean, there isn't Ed, anything I haven't seen. Ed, you've got no, 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 you've not to go to a concert. Is he coming to Australia? Because he's always on I think tour. he'll come back if he does all go. Because this is something you've got to do. It's, a, it's even if you do it once. I'm telling you, there isn't, um, there isn't uh, anyone sitting down from the minute he comes on stage. He is extraordinary. He comes on, he hasn't got water, he hasn't got a band. He just starts and it doesn't stop. And he always, always ends with one of my favourites of his. 
when you think this man is going to keel over in a minute, it's not him that's going to keel over, it's us in the audience dancing. We are done for. And you think he's finished. And he goes off and he comes back, and he goes off and he comes back. But because I've been to so many of the concerts, I know what the last song is. Helter Skelter. And so he's finished, and he's off the stage, and everybody that hasn't been before, they don't know. And they're like, oh my God. Oh. And everybody's just like draped over each other and the chairs. And there's no one on the stage. And then you hear, everybody's up. And he comes back on the stage, he's punching the air. Where does he get it from? I want it, whatever he's on, I want some. And everybody gives it their, like, their last all. And I can tell you, when he goes off, I don't know what happens when he goes off. I think he must go into resuscitation or something because it's what we need. You go out to the, the foyer and everybody, they've taken everything off that they can possibly take off and not be arrested. And oh my God, oh, they can't wait to get out in the air even if it's raining. Oh my God, did that happen? Did that happen? And your first thought will be, where is he again? I've got to, I've got to see the next one. I've got to see the next one. He is... He's a phenomenon on stage. He truly, truly is. I don't know where he gets the energy, but I've never seen anything like it. Um, I went to see the Rolling Stones concert two years ago. They were on big, big tour. And that was absolutely fantastic. We danced the whole time. It wasn't a patch on Paul's concert. And I mean that. And I'm a Stones fan. Rather than Beatles, I prefer the Stones. I like the rock and just love everything about it. But Mick and team are on stage with about 20 people. They've got dancers, they've got every instrument going, they've got big support. Paul is out there holding his own on his own. I went to see Rod Stewart. Yep. Fantastic. Fantastic. But he's got an army of people with him now. Paul is still out there just giving it some stick. Go, I, I do recommend you, if you haven't seen a Paul concert, make it an aim. Put it on the bucket list right at the top. Since you said that, Julia, I will. Now, I'm going to ask you, is there any John stories you can tell me? Because anyone can interview you. That's fine. I don't want to do that. I want to ask you, can you tell me things about John or stories that you haven't told anyone? Something that's fresh or new? Well, no, I can't think of anything after all these years that I haven't told anyone. My favourite memories of John, naturally, I think, are when we were all much younger because we were still, as a family, we've talked about families before, when... When I was young, certainly, John had a more traumatic early childhood than I did. And the result is John Lennon. The result is John Lennon. Uh, my sister and I had a far more settled childhood because we were with our, both of our parents. But John was never not in our lives. And when John and my mother and me and Jackie were in our big kitchen... Uh, either cooking or eating or making cakes or uh, messing around. That, they were my happiest memories because we were a family, a tight-knit family. And it was only, only, it was the death of our mother that blew that apart like shrapnel. But until then, until then, it was happiness. It really, really was. And all the, John had many bands. He had uh, uh, Johnny and the Rainbows, Johnny and the Moon Dogs. Guess whose band it was? <laughs> and then, of course, it morphed into eventually the Quarrymen. And I remember them all in that kitchen because my mother actually welcomed them in. She was the one with the artistic and musical talent that she had inherited from her own father, Pop, my grandfather, 
who was at sea, he was a sea captain, and he came home with two things from the war, uh, a banjo and a monkey. And we never met the monkey, but we had the banjo. And uh, John also inherited musical talent from his paternal grandfather, also John Lennon, um, who also played. And we think, we think he was in one of the lineups for the Kentucky Minstrels, but we're not sure. I did put in the book anything I wasn't sure of. If I'm not sure, I would say we think. I couldn't pin it, but everybody says it. But I said we think. But the musical bit was there from both sides. So my mother taught him to play the banjo as she had been taught to play, not the guitar. And then um, he played, my mother played the um, piano accordion. Do you remember the singer Edith Piaf? Yes, I do, the French singer. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Well, she had the piano accordion playing and my mother played that and sang the songs. She played the ukulele and the piano. And John was learning all this from her uh, when she died. But the basses came from, from my mother, the basses of that music directly to John came not from my grandfather but from um, our mother. I remember those times as really really happy times. I can see uh, we had a fireplace in the living room and they would sit one on the fireplace and one on the arm of the chair so that one would be higher my mother or lower and they would have the banjo and one would have their hand on the fingers on the frets while the other one was strumming and then they would turn around and change positions. And my mother was a perfectionist. He had to do it again and again and again until he got it right. And she'd say, press your fingers really hard. They will harden. They will harden. You know, because it, obviously it hurts. Do you play anything? Do you play one of those instruments? Like a, if you play a guitar it's or right. anything? Yeah, you've got to press really hard, haven't you? And it hurts initially. And yeah. then well, soon you don't feel it at all. You don't feel it. So my mother was saying, press hard, press hard. You won't feel it soon. So and those days are really, really happy days for me. Meantime, five minutes down the road on the next estate, Paul was learning how to play the guitar. He'd sort of gone straight to the guitar, not the banjo. And he, being left-handed, didn't know that you could have the left-handed guitar. And he's playing the guitar upside down because he's left-handed. And that's the beginnings of the dream team, a banjo and an upside-down guitar. Unbelievable story. It is, isn't it? Now, Julie, I just want to ask you, is there anything else you'd like to say? I'm leaving the platform to you before we say goodbye, but I've got to tell yeah. you, it's been a pleasure. Well, thank you, and it's been a pleasure to come. And everyone, and David Bedford, loads of people have said, Ed Plastic, you're going to love it. He's a nutcase. Well, I can verify that. <laughs> um, well, it's been lovely to get a, a little foot into Australia. When we did come, we absolutely loved it. Just that we were there for five weeks. We were there for work for about 10 days. And because my partner and I had never been, I said, please push our flights back to return because we're not coming home after that short time. And it's the only time we've been and we absolutely loved it. So I don't have much to do with Australia, so it's nice to get some sort of foot in. Can I just reiterate, strawberryfieldliverpool.com, please look, and juliabaird.eu, you will find my blog that will give you the history of Strawberry Field, and you will also find, if you're interested, the book and the CD. And I will sign it personally for you and send it straight away. I do it all myself. Somebody said... But where does it go? And so it comes to my house. Actually. <laughs> it's something I do. I enjoy doing myself. So strawberryfieldliverpool.com. Please, please look and have that look around that um, exhibition museum space. Support the Steps to Work program. There's donation things if you want to have a look. You can buy the T-shirt. It's the Red Gates T-shirt. Can you see the, the gates? Fantastic. It looks great. And where do they get it that is. from, Julia? They have to go on the internet? You get it in the shop. 
in strawberry fields. If you have a look online, you'll find it. You'll find hoodies. You'll find that hat that Don is wearing there. Yeah. There, yeah? yeah, the leather hat. Yeah. Helen Anderson, who made that hat for Don, the Beatles, and then the four of us had on me, my sister, and my two cousins. Don had four made for us as well. That very same hat, by that very same designer, is now in Strawberry Fields, if you're interested in having one. You can get all sorts of things. Have a look at the shop. Have a look at the gardens. Have a look at the Steps to Work program. It's all very, very interesting. Thank you again, Julia. And from Plastic EP here in Australia, we thank you so much for this interview. Thank you, Julia. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me and Strawberry Fields. Thank you.